It is 1130, so we will get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome uh, to the breakout session on curation workflows. Sherry is going to be doing uh, most of the introductions today, so Sherry is going to take over the screen. Good morning, um, wherever or afternoon, wherever you are. Um, uh, and my slides are showing because I did quite a few practicing. Thumbs up. All right, thank you. Okay. Um, well, welcome to the last breakout session of the 2021 Dataverse Community Meeting. Um, thank you for joining us um, and sticking with us for three to four days, depending on how many days you um, you joined in. I'm Sherry Lake, the repository librarian at the University of Virginia, and I'm co-chair with Sonia Bo Barbosa, um, the curation manager at Harvard Dataverse. Um, and we have some community notes documents. Um, if you have any questions, you can add them to chat or add them to the community notes document in the Q&A section. Um, we're gonna be answering all questions at the end of the, the presentation. Um, I'm gonna do a quick, very quick overview of data curation, sort of to set the stage um, of what we're gonna be um, I'm talking about um, today. Uh, and the, uh, at least in the United States, um, researchers are required by many federal and private agencies and funders to make the digital data that underlies the research openly available for sharing and reuse. But simply uploading the data in a repository is not enough to ensure its potential reuse. The data must be curated. Um, so I'm going to just um, give you offer a um, the following definition for data curation, um, a managed process throughout the data life cycle by which the data and data collections are cleaned, documented, standardized, formatted and interrelated. Um, and it includes other activities such as versioning, forming um, new formats, um, annotating metadata, and adding codes to raw data. Um, and, and as we just heard in the previous session, um, curation is a key part of planning for digital preservation um, in addition to, um, to reuse. So in order for data to be fully and publicly accessible to search, retrieve, analyze, with specialized curatorial actions should be taken to prepare the data. And, and these actions could include quality assurance for the data files and metadata, file integrity checks, documentation, metadata for creation for discovery, file transformations into archival formats, um, and also selection of suitable license and copyright. Curation is multifaceted and it's complex and curation can mean different things to different stakeholders. Um, and in addition to those curation tasks, um, could be code review, file renaming, um, risk management, which is actually sort of looking at um, the data for um, privacy, um, FERPA uh, privacy laws for de-identification. Um, and there's also some sort of common curation activities that overlap with digital curation activities um, that um, go into the um, preservation of um, digital and data collections, such as provenance, um, file audits, and file format transformations that I said before for um, archival um, versions. Curation actions vary and depend on the type of data being curated. The scope and focus of organizations during curation and think about also your community of curators and who is going to possibly be reusing the data set. Um, uh, there has been um, a recent study. Um, so how do you determine what is the most essential activities for your repository? especially when you may have limited resources. 
uh, based on research from librarians from the University of North Carolina and Duke University, they analyze their repository curation activities and they offer three distinct levels of curation. Level one, curation focuses just on the repository program or the system. Maybe the repository itself facilitates self-deposit and it could have some maybe light mediated deposit, um, generally um, in the metadata to help discovery. Level two has some more human interactions, um, looks at the quality assurance of data packages, um, looks at metadata for more completeness and comprehensibility. Uh, and they also can check for um, presence of personally identifiable information for, um, for risk management, um, and also um, renaming file structure and anything at this level that is done to the original files are usually uh, made changes in a curation log. Um, then level three could involve hands-on manipulation of data sets. M looking at the data and the code um, with an eye toward reproducibility, in-depth quality assurance, um, and, and also making sure possibly that the code runs. Um, defining the levels and the sets of actions are important to help frame your portfolio of what services you can achieve, um, especially when resources are limited. So to start our um, discussion today, we have um, a nice full lineup of um, presenters. First, we have uh, Mingjing Ping from the Australian Data Archive, and he will be presenting um, a pre-recorded video since he's in Australia, um, demonstrating the Australian Data Archive deposit and preservation tool. Then Philip Konzet from the Arctic University of Norway will talk about curation support and data NO. Mara Blake from the Johns Hopkins University will introduce us to the data curation network and how the collabor and how the collaborative collaboration works um, at the local curation of the JHU data archive. Amber Leahy from the Scholars Portal will demonstrate the data curation tool for curating survey data in Dataverse. Mandy Gooch from the H.W. Odom Institute for Research and Social Science will give us an overview of how the Odom Institute is supporting reproducibility research and data curation. Michael Steelworthy and Alex Cooper from Canada's NDRIO Portage Network and the Dataverse Metadata Working Group will present documenting best practices with Dataverse metadata and curation guides. And finally, Sonia of the Harvard Dataverse will cover Harvard Dataverse's fee-based curation services. So I am going to stop sharing my presentation so we can get on with um, the pre-recorded um, video. So I'm going to stop sharing there and now I'm going to share um, this. But, but first I'm going to give a, a slight little background. Um, ADAP is internal to the Australian Data Archive where the archivists use the tool to assist with managing their archiving workflows and automating the different archiving directories in association with depositing, processing, and disseminating users' data. And let's go. Okay, so I'm going to share the video and here we go. Hi everyone, this is Minjin Peng from Australian Data Archive. In this video, I'm going to show you a curation and preservation tool we use for data workflows. The tool is called ADAPT2, which stands for ADA Deposit and the Preservation Tool version 2. The aim of this tool is for archivists to improve their working efficiencies by automating part of the archiving process. At the same time, Activities on this tool are captured by the logging system, which generates log files for improved B ontology for future reviews. As you can see, there are three options provided by the tool, which are basically three different workflows. So let's start with the first one, new only. 
which will create new add ID in the directory. Add ID is a unique identifier that is for internal use within our stream data archive. And here we click get add ID button and there is a successful submission with a new add ID 104. Okay, so let's go to the file system and there's a new folder here with original and the processing subfolders in it and also a log file. Within this log file, we can see the activity details like operator, uh, date and time, tool used, as well as the affiliation of the operator. Cool, let's go to the second option. Okay, from second option, we can create add ID directory and optionally we can upload files and create new data set. And we can see there are one, two, three, three sections within this option. The first one is data source. We can select either the URL of a data set as the data source, or we can simply upload files from our local machine. In this case, we are just gonna copy the URL of this data set and paste it here. Okay, looks all good. And also there's a switch here. And we, if we would like to copy metadata or not, if we switch it to yes, then we are gonna create a new data set. And for the second section, we can see that all the metadata fields are grayed out, are disabled, as we are gonna copy the metadata from the data source data set. And what we are gonna do is select the destination dataverse. In this case, we use dataverse data, for example, and root dataverse. So the new data set which is about to be created is gonna be located within the root dataverse of dataverse data. And the last section is about the file. There are two lists, the left one, is for the files that are gonna be in the archive folder, while the right one is for the files that will go to this set. Okay, we just turn it on, select all of them, and then give it a go. It may take a few seconds, for the files to be downloaded from the data set and then uploaded to the archive folder and the data set. Okay, successful. So we get a new add ID, which is 105, and a new data set with a link here and a DOI. And also the data set is in draft with all the data set information displayed here. And there are a uh, preserved file list and a curated file list. So let's go to the data set to have a look. This is the brand new data set we just created with all the metadata from source data set and also the files. Okay, looks all good. Then we go to the file system We'd like to have a look at 105 and within the original folder, we can see the files we just downloaded, just uploaded actually. And there's a log file, what we can see here, there are many details about activity, except uh, the name, time, and the tool. We also have source URL, as well as destination URL, and the two file lists, preserved list, curated list. And then we also have an email notification. That's basically the detail of the submission. Okay, then let's go to the third option. For the third option is different from the previous two and the entry point of the third option is to select an existing add ID and then we can start um, maybe adding files, creating a shell data set. So 
like this one. We, we are going to select the one we just created, which is 105. And you can see the link shows up. That's the link to the data set we just created. Yes. And then we can select files, upload files, just like what we did in option two. So um, in this case, we are going to upload a file here. Which one? So this one. And then are we going to create a new data set? No, because the shell data set exists. And this time we can upload these files to the archive folder. Give it a go. All good. And we go back to see the 105 within the original. Yes, the file is there. And if there is no shell data set, for example, pick another one. Yeah, there's no DOI found, which means there's no shell data set. And in this case, we can create a new shell data set for that add ID. In this case, we still select, okay, waiting for the loading. It's just a field, mandated fields, data set title, let's say demo name, email, description test, subjects. Okay, and then we are gonna create it within the root dataverse. And we are gonna upload this file to the LRD6. Looks good. Let's give it a go. Okay. So we created a new data set with this DOI and we click link to have a look. Yes, all good. With file uploaded and mandate here. Title demo, author, my name test for description and the subjects. So, and then we go back to file system to have a look. So six, that's it. Okay, within the original, yes, the file's there. And if we check the log, you can see that uh, local upload, that's the activity name and that's the file, and also the destination URL. Okay, I think that's it. Um, thank you very much for watching. I will see you later. Okay, and um, thank um, the Australian Data Archive for that. Um, if you have any questions, um, please, um, add them to the Google Doc and we'll make sure that the um, questions are passed along. Uh, we will um, also, um, there's some more information slightly in, in the slides. The link is there in the Google Doc. But um, now this time we're going to go to Philip. Um, if you want to share your screen and um, let, talk to us about curation support and Dataverse NO. Yeah, thank you, Sherry. Can you see my screen? It says your start. Yes, we, we, we can see the. Yes, you just perfect. Right. OK. Yeah, so uh, this is some of the topics I'm going to talk about. Uh, first, I gave you some key facts about our repository, Dataverse NO. Uh, then I'll talk about levels, different levels of curation. Um, about curation, our cur curation workflows, and then how we have organized curation support uh, at the repository. And then I'll present some supporting resources we use for creation. And if I have time still, I'll mention some challenges and desirables. 
I think some of you have seen this slide before. So Dataverse NO is a national generic repository for open research data from researchers at Norwegian research organizations. It's a curated repository and it's aligned with the FAIR principles. And since last year, we have been Quarter Seal certified. Um, so it's a national repository, but it has an institutional focus. Currently, we have 10 partner institutions. They are all universities or university colleges. Uh, I'll present some kindly uh, um, different, um, partly different uh, dis uh, distinctions between curation levels than the one uh, Sherry has been talking about. Um, so quarter seal uh, distinguishes between uh, these four levels of curation. So at level A, the content is basically distributed as deposited. Then you have curation at level B, that, which is basic curation. That's with, that means that you may briefly check um, check the contents and, and, and add some basic metadata or documentation. And then you have level three, uh, C, which is enhanced curation, where you, for instance, would have conver conversion to new formats or enhancement of documentation. And then you have level D, uh, which is data level curation, which is as in C, but uh, in addition, you have all, you could also uh, have some editing of depositing, deposited data for accuracy. So uh, the way I inter interpret these uh, levels um, uh, in that was NO, we have uh, we allow a level A, of course, if the, if the curate if the deposited um, data already is in line with our guidelines. But then we do level B, C, or D um, curation as needed. But level D uh, curation, uh, that is data level curation, does not include any any assessment of the scientific quality of the data, of course. So we may, for instance, uh, comment uh, some missing values in a tabular files file or uh, comment a mismatch between abbreviations as used in a data file versus as explained in, in the documentation. Um, and curation at data is mainly, is as a main rule, uh, 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 carried out through uh, feedback. So curators would give requests or suggest changes, and then the depositors carry out the changes. We have two main uh, curation workflows. There is a basic curation workflow, and then there is a special curation workflow for data sets to be involved in double-blind peer review of publication manuscripts. So let me briefly talk about each of them. Uh, so the basic curation workflow starts actually with a deposit workflow. So the depositor will prepare the data for deposit and then create a data set in Dataverse NO, um, submit the data set for review, and then a curator would uh, curate the data set. Um, and then the curator would have to decide if the data set is in line with our guidelines. If the answer is yes, the data set is published. If the answer is no, which is usually the case, we return the data set to the depositors, depositor and uh, together with a curation report where we describe the, change, the necessary changes. Uh, so the depositor would then have to revise the data set and resubmit it for, re, for re, uh, review or curation. Um, yeah, so uh, then there is the sp special curation work workflow for double blind peer review, which uh, is based on the on the, on the core or the basic workflow. So uh, the original non anonymized data set would be uh, curated until it is ready for publication. Uh, but then the curator will create an anonymized version of the data set as an anonymous curator in an anonymous a review collection. So basically, we would then replace names with NN, for instance, in the metadata that is uh, registered in the, in the Dataverse software, uh, but also in files, both in the contents and the file metadata, which is can be may be stored in the file itself. Uh, and then we send a private URL to the depositor, and the depositor would share this private URL with the publisher. And then the publisher would have this peer review process, and maybe the peer reviews would also have some feedback on the data themselves, uh, so that the depositor was, would need to revise the original data set and then sub resubmit it for review. And then we finally, the, the curator finally would publish the original data set and delete the anonymized version of the data set in the review collection. Uh, how 
um, how is our curation support organized? Um, so we are we have a distributed curation support, which means that um, uh, support staff at the partner institutions uh, they would curate the data sets within their collections. So UIT would curate the data sets within the UIT collections collection and so on. So this means that researchers uh, get local um, uh, deposit and publishing support at their home institution. We have some supporting resources um, that, that support curation. Of course, we have a deposit uh, guide, uh, including a readme file template. It is, this is, um, I mean, this is uh, mainly aimed at depositors, but of course the curators need to have in-depth knowledge of this. And then we have a curation uh, guidelines, including a curation report template, and then we have curation training and a curation network. So we'll have a short look at the curation guidelines and curation training and network. So this is the curation guidelines. It contains these main sections, but the first section is, is about the, the, the core tasks of uh, um, curation. And here you see them. Um, first, there's a general uh, introduction, and then uh, we talk about the uh, metadata and uh, files and terms of use or licenses and then uh, returning the data set to the author and then finally publish the data set and also how to handle a new version of a published data set. So these parts, the metadata files and uh, terms of use, uh, basically is about checking whether the data set complies with our deposit guidelines. But then when we return the data set to the depositor, we would, send, we would also have to send them an email explaining uh, the changes that they have to make and we recommend that our curators use this uh, curation report template and the reason there are two reason, uh, reasons for that and the first is because this this kind of standardized report makes the work of curators uh, easier because much of the information we usually provide in our feedback to the depositor uh, has to be repeated in each email so this kind of information is already included in the template and also uh, depositors, we have experienced that some depositors uh, may get the impression that the requested changes are kind of invented by an individual picky curator. So this standardized report makes it clear that the changes are necessary uh, because of the guidelines and that they aim at making the data as fair as possible. And the second main reason is that this also helps us to align curation support across institutional collections. This is one of the feedback that we got from the core trust seal certification. And how do we do that? It's, it's very easy. So it's basically just a Word uh, document uh, available in Norwegian and English. And we share this in team in our teams area with our uh, curators. And then we have the curation and training uh, and network. Uh, so um, uh, EUIT, my university, provides a basic training of collection managers and curators uh, at new partner institutions. We also have two annual meetings where curators from all partner institutions discuss issues relating to uh, uh, curation and collection management. So for instance, uh, about uh, metadata, file formats, licenses, licensing, and so on. You also One have Thank you. We also have continuous support, um, knowledge ex exchange and discussions in, in these teams. Uh, and we also organize workshops and webinars for collection managers and curators. So I have one minute. Um, let me, I think I, yeah, I also already mentioned this main challenge to al align curation support across collections. Um, and we approach this through this uh, common guidelines, both deposit guidelines and, and curation guidelines and this report template. And now we also have a plan to align curation skills for our support staff with national skills, with a national skills framework being developed by Research Data Align, uh, Alliance in Norway. Uh, let me briefly mention some uh, desirables. Uh, I think it would, uh, I think um, if we could, um, include the mandatory and recommended fields in the first round of metadata registration in the metadata in the dataverse software this would help us to make depositors register uh, all the recommended metadata before before we have to curate the data set 
And also, as uh, Miguel has mentioned, I would also um, think that a common framework for file um, preferred file formats would help us, because now each repository has, has to come up with their own lists. And so if we had this kind of common framework, the individual repositories could endorse uh, this uh, framework in their lists. So uh, we have actually done some work on this, which I may share with others if you're interested. Um, and also, we would like to have some more advanced curation management support within or integrated in the Dataverse software, including features like uh, being, being able to track curation status of datasets in review and also giving integrated feedback within datasets and files instead of having to write an email. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Philip. That was great. There's um, and quite a bit of chat about your templates in the in the chat, um, and we're, we're putting those um, comments and um, questions in the um, Google Doc. Next, we have Mara Blake from the Johns Hopkins University um, to introduce us to the Data Curation Network and how um, it's being used locally at the JHU Data Archive. Hi, everybody. I'm going to try and share my screen. Looks great, thank you. Looks good, all right, thanks. Thanks for the feedback. So thanks for having me today. I'm really excited to talk to you all about both collaborative and local data curation workflows, both in the data curation network and locally what we do at Johns Hopkins University for the JHU Data Archive. So I'll start out telling you a little bit about the data curation network. And the data curation network is a pretty unique collaboration of academic generalist repositories and nonprofit generalist repositories in the United States who have collaborated together to create a shared staffing model for data curation across members of the network with, you can see the mission here, the goal of helping researchers share data that are more reusable, um, more ethical and overall better. So that's the mission of the network. And there's a couple different parts to the network. Curation is obviously a big part of it, um, where member institutions can submit data sets for curation by other members of the network based on uh, disciplinary or technical expertise. But we also have a large emphasis in the DCN, and I'm going to abbreviate to DCN for Data Curation Network, but I'll try to say it a couple times as well. Um, on education, so offering trainings um, and professional development opportunities, especially around this, as curation is such an emerging and developing professional practice, really supporting the professionals who work in that area. Uh, a close complement to that and often created through educational uh, trainings are the DCN primers which are openly available resources that present some background information and best practices on curating specific types of data. And so those are openly available. The network also has interest groups that convene around particular topics, as well as a wider community that operates a little more informally, but discussion, bouncing ideas off each other, et cetera. And we're fortunate to be joined in this session by several members of the Data Curation Network, in addition to myself. So I'd invite any of you all, please, to chime in on the chat if I miss something or get something wrong. Really appreciate the help. So I'll talk a little bit about the workflow for the Data Curation Network as this collaborative operation. And the whole point is that the um, local workflow should not be interrupted through participation in the DCN for the depositor in particular. So the depositor um, goes through whatever the typical local practice is. And then that data curation network, if the local institution chooses to send it out to the data curation network for curation by someone at another institution um, sort of acts as a human level microservice um, that the researcher is aware of, but it doesn't adjust their flow too much. As part of that, local institutions are expected to provide all 
of the local infrastructure for their archives. So they host the data, they still make the data available that's still on the institution, but the data curation network operates in a platform agnostic way. So we at Hopkins use Dataverse, but other institutions use other repository platforms and it all works fine through the data curation network. When something enters the data curation network, the DCN coordinator reviews that data set and assigns it based on expertise to a curator. Sometimes there's a little matchmaking that goes on. They curate it. I'm going to talk about the curate steps that we take in a minute. And then there's mediation between the local depositor and or the local curator and the DCN curator. Um, and then, you know, changes are recommended, approved, etc. When the DCN curator is reviewing the data set, they use what is called the curate steps, makes a handy acronym for us. So you can see these steps are um, what the data curation network bases its curation workflow around, always with an eye towards reuse, typically not looking as far as reproducibility, but making sure that what's deposited data and code could be re reused by a secondary user. So the files are checked as well as the metadata, the curator tries to understand and run the files, um, makes a suggestion for requesting information that request is typically handled by the local curator instead of the DCN curator. Uh, recommendations for uh, augmenting the metadata, transforming the files and evaluating for fairness, there's an implied D step throughout where the documentation of changes and recommended changes happens throughout this process. Um, and some of these steps are optional. It's not all cases that files are transformed. It's not all cases where the metadata is augmented, but there are recommendations. Similar to some of the other levels that you've seen so far um, from the previous presentations, you know, there is a variety in the level of curation in the data sets that depend on the need of the data set, uh, expertise to execute certain levels of curation and uh, depositor willingness to, to make changes. So that's the data curation network. I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit about the JHU Data Archive and our participation in the data curation network. See how I'm doing on time. All right, so the JHU Data Archive is part of data services at Johns Hopkins, which is a suite of services throughout the research life cycle to help people find, use, visualize, manage, and share data. So the JHU Data Archive is part of that share part that we help with. The platform is based in Dataverse. You can see a screen grab of it here. Uh, unlike many instances of Dataverse, we do not offer self-deposit. It is mediated by one of our data management consultants who uh, works with depositors through the process and also serve as curators locally and in the data curation network. I'm fortunate enough to have three of our curators here, Chen, Marley, and Dave, I believe are here. So please feel free to chime in on the chat um, as well. Uh, it's open to JHU affiliates. Uh, it's a fully open archive. There's no restricted access and there's no additional cost up to one terabyte. <clears throat> and especially because our deposit process is mediated, we have a couple differences when with our local workflow. Um, but here you can see our workflow broken out where when a researcher deposits, they sign some agreements, fill out some forms to, to help the data management consultant create a draft record with the data that the depositor shares and um, the metadata that they, they complete for us. And then the curation workflow, and if it's filtered through us instead of the DCN, uh, similarly, we assign a data management consultant uh, to the data set based on availability and expertise might be a collaborative effort in some cases. We have a screening process um, for identifiers or other information that would be problematic to share in an open repository. And then we similarly to the DCN workflow go through the same curated steps that I just shared. 
And then there's an editing process based on the recommendations of that consultant. Uh, and similar to the workflow that Philip described, um, we typically ask the depositor to make changes unless they're very small metadata changes um, based on the recommendations. And then <clears throat> a, a draft record is created, a private link is shared with the depositor for approval. And once we get that, we feed into publishing the workflow where we publish the data set, provide access, and move the data set in the full package into our preservation system. Uh, so we joined the- One minute. Thank you. We joined the DCN in 2017 to participate in the Sloan funded implementation grant phase. That was a three-year grant that is just ending now. The Data Curation Network is becoming a, a fully fledged non-grant funded organization. We started out with just two members of our team participating as, as curators, and it, we have changed that to four. We have four team members from data services participating, and then I serve as the institutional representative. We participated in the Data Curation Network Education Grant and those activities, as well as interest groups. And participation in the DCN really informed our local curation practices. We did not prior to joining the DCN, work through the curated steps as you saw them for our deposits, even though the workflow was mediated. And that's a change we've made um, since participating in the DCN. So it's really been a, a really nice symbiotic relationship for us. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about both Hopkins and the DCN. You can see there's some contact information for the DCN here, as well as my own. So. Uh, I'm looking forward to your questions during this session, but please feel free to visit the DCN website or reach out with any questions. Thanks so much. Thank you, Mar. Um, th there was a, a um, great presentation um, about um, your services. Uh, next, we have Amber Leahy from the Scholars Portal and the demonstration on data curation tool. Um, I'm not sure if it's going to be a live one or not. I'm quite impressed, as I said on Twitter, um, with um, all the um, live demos that the Dataverse 2021 meeting has had. Um, so take it away, Amber. Hey, I'm going to start sharing my screen now. Um, I think, Mara, you might need to stop sharing your or maybe not. Maybe I can bypass it. Here we go. OK, perfect. So Sherry, to disappoint you, I, I don't have a live demo, but I do have some, some screenshots that show the, the workflow. I'm not that brave. <laughs> so um, thank you for inviting me to speak on this panel. It's so interesting to hear about uh, Dataverse curation workflows. And, and so we've been working on um, a workflow and an embedded tool that would allow uh, users, librarians, curators, whoever, to curate survey data in Dataverse using the data curation tool. So just some background about Dataverse in Canada. You've probably heard from others, but it's a multi-institution. There, there, there are a few instances of Dataverses in Canada, but one instance, our instance at Scholars Portal, is a multi-institutional Dataverse um, running 59 distinct institutional Dataverse repository collections. Um, and we've established, we are establishing this community of practice and, and working through our partners in the national digital research infrastructure space, um, as well as working with uh, Dataverse experts through the Portage Network and all of our institutional service members. Um, institutional libraries play a really important role in the service outreach, training, promotion, curation, and long-term preservation. And, and they played this role because of their close connections to the researchers and the research services on campus, as well as their advanced data and metadata competencies and skills. And they're just really adept at, at doing this kind of collaborative work. And I will also mention that in some cases, data libraries in Canada have played a role in managing uh, certain data collections and archives for specific research domains. And um, this is really uh, prominent in the social sciences. So just quickly, some examples of curators. I had mentioned data libraries and institutional repository staff, um, and as well as those archives, which not only exist in Canada, but also around the world, who specialize in managing survey data and polling data. 
Um, and there are many survey data projects and project managers working with large scale survey data that may also be interested in using this. And as Mara has pointed out, there are now curation networks emerging similarly in Canada, um, based on the model that was described for the DCN. Um, so we are starting to see that emerge and, and really just like keen researchers and support staff for research projects. So just quickly, uh, Dataverse really supports survey data well. Um, the support for social science survey data and public opinion polls and behavioral research is, is really quite good in this system. There is a lot of metadata support for um, not only the citation block, but social sciences in general, as well as others. And the social science metadata in particular is based on the data documentation initiative standard framework for describing social science and behavioral research data. So that's great. It's based on a standard and it helps researchers or curators to describe the survey collection methods, the time periods, universes, sampling, weighting, all of those things that go into um, making survey data understandable and reusable. Um, and, and one of the really neat features is that it supports this DDI codebook or this like encapsulation of a data set together with the metadata that can be exchanged between systems and can be reused, um, especially for archives and preservation purposes. And so any file format is supported in the system, but it, it specifically does something extra for tabular data. And so file formats like SPSS, Stata, CSV, and Excel are, are ingested into the Dataverse system and a, a Dataverse tab format is, is generated um, for preservation purposes. And in addition to that, um, metadata is extracted and converted into DDI XML um, automatically upon ingest. And all of the original files in those access copies are stored and provided for download for reuse. Uh, oh, here we go. So I wanted to see what this looks like, and, and, and really this is just taking from what's already in the Dataverse documentation, but the goal in the system for this ingest process is to really extract the data contents from the files, from those proprietary files, and archive them in an application neutral and easily readable, human readable, uh, machine actionable way. So what does the data curation tool do? It, it goes one step further than the tabular data ingest. Um, and it's really about enhancing that source data, that source metadata as it comes in. And this can be reused um, to generate new research outputs and to really enhance that reusability of the data. So I wanted to show you guys what this looks like. Um, so I've uploaded a data set. It's about Canadian perspectives on, uh, on the impacts of COVID-19. Um, from our National Statistical Institute, Statistics Canada. And so here I've uploaded the SPSS SAV file. And um, you'll notice that uh, there's this little gear icon that appears. And this is how you access the data curation tool as the admin or the curator for this data set. So I'm going to click on the data curation tool and it's gonna to present to me um, a very familiar kind of view of your data in, with columns and rows, um, but also that metadata that describes the data and then and the sort of underlying raw data itself. And you'll notice that on the right screen, on the right hand side of, of the table view, there is the option to, to view the data with the little eye icon, or there is an edit button indicated by this little pen icon. So oh, when I click on the view icon for a particular variable, let me just go back. It's going to show me the um, the frequencies of that data, the values, the categories, and and the percentage um, for those for those categories. So that's to help the curator understand that data immediately without having to open up proprietary software um, outside of the system. Um, and then next, if you click on the pen icon, you can actually edit some of this variable information or add or enhance some of that. And so for survey data, this, is, this can be really important 
for reuse and understandability. So I'm going to go ahead and start. Um, oh, and I'll just, I'll just mention that uh, with survey data, oftentimes there are just so many um, supplementary files and documentation, whether it's questionnaires, um, code books, or um, coding schemes, and, and so on and so forth. And so we're used to seeing these being stored in um, separate documents, Word documents, PDFs. So I'm just showing you an example here of a PDF that was provided that is a questionnaire for this particular survey. And I'm gonna go ahead and enter some of the literal questions that were asked of respondents that correspond to this particular variable, as well as interview instructions that may not have been asked of the respondents, but help to inform how that interviewer coded that response, as well as um, a universe statement that lets the, the user, the users of this data know who was asked this particular question. And, and there really are just so many things you could add here to enhance this understandability and, and reuse of this data. Where's the next slide? There we go. Okay. I think I went too far. The other thing I wanted to know in this tool that you can also group variables if you if you are working with um, demographic variables or a group of variables that are related, you can group them using the add group um, option here in the top right. And then you can see that I've added this particular variable to this group here. Um, and this is helpful for if you are um, applying certain similar codes or, or metadata to a group of variables, or if you just want to be able to help users navigate this very large data set. Um, so you can see here that I've isolated this particular uh, group on the side and it's showing me what variables are part of it. And then I wanted to also show you, sorry, there's so many overlapping <laughs> screens, but if you just focus on this particular one. Um, one I minute. Also, thank you. Um, I also uh, was able to search and identify a weight variable and in survey data, uh, weighting is really important in order to get a representative um, understanding of, of the population as a whole. Um, so here you can declare a weight and then you can assign that weight to um, a particular data set, and I'm going to show you really quickly. So what does this all mean? What does this all do? So you're going to be able to now um, see, see these enhancements in a view of the data that is available publicly. Um, so if you go into the Data Explorer tool, which would be available to your users, seems to be really slow. You can see that now um, that weight that I've applied has been applied to the public use version of this. So you get those weighted frequencies as well as all of that metadata. And I'm just showing you quickly that you can do cross tabulations in this in the Data Explorer tool. And if you've enhanced that metadata, it enhances that process. And then you can also get a code book view here of your data to package up, which is independent um, uh, from the data itself and from the Dataverse system that could, could live on with open formats, open formats of your survey data. Okay, I'm just going to stop sharing and just quickly, if I have any time, um, there are many use cases for this, but the one that I just want to highlight is really that we can start to really think about data files, variables within data files as, as reusable objects at, that have reusable documentation that can generate um, new new surveys, new uses um, of, of applying this kind of curation to data. Okay, that's all from me. Let me, there's a delay a little bit in my screen sharing. Thank you, Amber. That, it's all open source and it's integrated with the latest version of Dataverse. Yes, and, and that's one of our, one of Dataverse's many integrated tools. Um, if you just check the documentation, um, you can turn on, on, on your local Dataverse installation. Um, next, we're going to have Mandy Gooch, and she's going to talk to us about um, the Odom Institute and how they're supporting reproducible research and data curation. Take it away, Mandy. 
Thank you guys so much. So let me share my screen. If it's not working, I can I can share my screen, but um, I'll I'll let you. It's deciding to. Okay, I have your presentation up and ready too. If you want me to share it for you. Sorry, Zoom is acting very weird right now. You just give me the word if you'd like. Uh, sorry, my Zoom is sort of locking up on me. So you might want to so I can close it and come like the next person go and then I'll come in after. <laughs> oh, that's, that's actually Sherry. That's fine as well. Uh, Michael, um, I think it's Sherry can introduce Michael. Oh, oh no, you're there. Up. We got you. Perfect. Can you there we got Mandy. Can you see my whole screen? <laughs> yes. And you there. Yes, it looks great. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> I don't know why it was being so weird, but anyway. Um, so thank you all for having me. Uh, my name is Mandy Gooch. I am a research data archivist here at the Odom Institute for Research and Social Science at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Um, today, I'm gonna be talking a bit about supporting reproducible research and data curation and give you an overview of the Odom Institute's practices and a tool that we have been working on for a little while now. Um, so let me move to the next slide. Okay, so um, first off, I want to give a little bit of background about the Odom Institute Data Archive, which is the entity that I'm representing right now. Um, we are comprised of three staff. We have Tumai Christian, the assistant director, myself, and my colleague Cheryl Thompson. Um, and just to let you all know what we do, uh, we've been around for over 50 years, beginning with the acquisition of the Lewis Harris Data Center in 1965. And we're home to one of the largest catalogs of social science research data in the US. In addition, we manage and provide access to the UNC Dataverse repository in partnership with our internal research data in and information systems unit here at Odom. Uh, we also support reproducible research in our work with AJPS, the American Journal of Political Science, and SPPQ, State Politics and Policy Quarterly, implementing their data verification policies, which then goes hand in hand with one of our many projects underway here at Odom, Core 2, which I like to call co -ray -ray. Um, So, moving into the next section here. So, um, just a little context for the people that we work with, our clients, um, throughout the research life cycle. Uh, we typically see faculty, research institutes, and uh, diverse research teams, sometimes from across multiple universities and research groups here at the Odom Institute. They come to us at various stages of the research life cycle, sometimes pre-proposal, sometimes middle of the project, sometimes after the project's already been completed. Um, and what do we offer in terms of services? Not only do we offer um, collaboration, we also do DMP reviews, we provide data management throughout the project, we also do training and education on data management best practices, and then we offer um, archival assistance as well. So here is a basic overview of our curation workflow for clients who decide they want our full curation services. So we offer customizable service tiers for fee to clients based on their needs and on our collection priorities. Um, users are more than welcome to self-archive for free within UNC Dataverse, but they can also opt into a guided or full data curation support. Um, so as you can see here, we have the client coming to us at the beginning phase in the deposit area, um, and we work with them with their submission information package, their SIP, um, and we review their files for completeness and develop a plan for processing those files. Once we've done that, we then determine the appropriate metadata, we create the archival information package, the APE, um, and then we ensure that there's access to the files within the UNC Dataverse. So we move through the processing section by checking that the data are clean and understandable with supplementary documents documentation such as codebook and readme, um, and we apply a standard vocabulary for the record within Dataverse. We move then through the final steps of ensuring the data are accessible um, as appropriate, 
um, and brand the dataverse, setting the terms of use according to the requirements of the depositor or the institution, um, setting any access restrictions and enabling those workflows. And then finally, we review and test the record to make sure that the data are properly ingested and the record contains enough information for users to understand its contents. Once all of that has been completed, we then publish the data and make the DIP or the dissemination information package accessible to the public. So what does this look like in terms of our data verification workflow? So when we're talking about curating for reproducibility, um, we've taken basically our curation workflow and we've integrated and adapted it into our data verification workflow. So this is the workflow that we provide as part of our work with the journals such as AJPS and SPPQ that I mentioned earlier. So we work with these journals to support and implement their data verification policies, which requires us to ensure that the research underlying their accepted manuscripts is computationally reproducible. As you can see in this very simplified version of our workflow, the author submits their verification submission package for review. The curators and the verifiers review all of the files and verify that the results output by the code and data match the results from the manuscript. If there are issues, we send, the, we send back a report to the editor who then sends that report off to the author and the author is required to address the issues and resubmit their verification package. Keep in mind that most submissions do not pass on the first round and we usually average about two resubmissions per manuscript with about six hours of labor per manuscript. Um, but once everything does pass the curation and verification review, the curators then update the Dataverse record and publish the data for users. So finally, the Dataverse citation, once that Dataverse record has been published, um, we take that citation and then we send that to the editors in a final report, who the, and they send that off to the authors. So there are some key differences in what we check um, and how we go through the data curation process in order to curate materials for reproducibility, especially in the context of this data verification workflow. So here's a very general um, checklist, and I don't have time, unfortunately, to go over everything, um, but I've broken out some key items for this presentation, and I'm happy to answer additional questions after um, or via email. I'll provide all that information. Um, so the curators and the verifiers both have their own separate tasks and they review the materials that pertain to their tasks. However, instead of making changes and communicating directly with the authors, uh, we write up the issues in this report um, and we send that report to the editors who then sends it to the authors. Um, the authors are required to make the necessary changes to address all of the identified issues. And then the curators and verifiers review the, the resubmission of that verification submission package. Um, to make certain that it meets the requirements of the policy. So what are some of the major things we look for when curating for reproducibility? So the data and code are certainly integral, but we find that the documentation is just as important when curating for reproducibility. Um, we require a robust codebook with all variables, variable descriptions, values, and value labels, including for missing or blank values, um, be provided in a preservation-friendly PDF format. The README itself should be a complete inventory of all files in the verification package with a description of each file describing its use in the analysis. We need detailed information to also be included in the README about the compute environment the original analyses were conducted on. Um, and additionally, we also need information about all other dependencies necessary to verify the results. So we need to know the statistical software that they've used, the version of the software, packages and package versions used, all of those things should be provided in the readme. Um, finally, full data citations to any original source data used in the analyses must be provided in either the codebook or the readme. If there are access restrictions due to copyright or terms of use, then the author must provide detailed instructions to secondary users on how to access the restricted data from the source. And this ensures that users can reconstruct the analysis data set using the original source data on their own with the code provided in the Dataverse by the authors. So next, when it comes to the code, not only do we require it to run and produce the same results from the manuscript, but we require that it be well commented so users can understand which parts of the code generate which tables, figures, et cetera. Um, we also require that absolute paths be removed and made relative and that the code automatically installs the necessary packages. There are a lot of other requirements as well, but these are some of the big things that help us make the code reproducible without requiring a secondary user to heavily tweak it to get it to run. 
So basically, we put an emphasis on documenting everything really, really well. Um, and we find that this goes a long way to making your research reproducible in the, re in the future. So how do we support curating for reproducibility? So we've developed some guidance documentation to help authors create better and more informative readmes and codebooks. Um, you can see a couple of screenshots here of the AJPS codebook guide that we've put together. Uh, we're also in the process of building similar documentation for R and Stata users to help them review and edit their code to increase the odds of it running properly on the initial submission, or to at least minimize the errors identified so the fixes are easier to address. Um, the great thing about these documents are the tips and examples provided, uh, which help the author see what is necessary for a README codebook and eventually for the code uh, to pass the verification review. One minute. Thank you. So <clears throat> finally, I would be remiss in not mentioning the major project we've been working on for the past couple of years, Corey Ray. So to support curating for reproducibility, we've been working with our colleagues in Odom's Research Data and Information Systems on Corey Ray, which is a confirmable reproducible research environment, an online platform for streamlining the data curation and verification workflow. So what does this look like? Well, Carrera will bring together all the stakeholders involved in our current workflow under one web-based application. It'll allow for communication amongst appropriate stakeholders throughout the submission review. The key features of Carrera will be tracking of manuscripts by different stakeholders throughout the process, detailed notes at the file level to highlight issues or missing information within the submission package, the ability for authors to create their compute environment dependencies in CoRayRay -Ray and run their verification packages. Verifiers can then rerun the submission in CoRayRay -Ray to ensure the outputs match the results in the manuscript. And when ready, the final verification package, including the software environment dependencies, can be pushed with robust metadata to Dataverse, reviewed in Dataverse, and then published for public consumption. And finally, Here's a little sneak peek of what it looks like right now. We're still in development, but we'll begin internal testing in the next week or so. Um, this is a screenshot where you can see a manuscript that has already been created within Coray Ray. And here you can create resubmissions, edit or view files, edit metadata, view the verification report, launch a Jupyter notebook, run the analysis using that Jupyter notebook, and assign access to the appropriate stakeholders. It's super exciting, and we cannot wait to begin testing. <laughs> So thank you all very much. Here's our webpage for the Odom Institute and some uh, links to the core to co Ray Ray project and my email address if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mandy. That was great. And um, to my, I know is on on this, but we love co Ray Ray. Um, good to see um, an update. And it's really exciting, um, especially if the rest of us could possibly use that tool. Awesome. Great. Um, next up, we have Michael Steelworthy and Alex Cooper. Um, they're going to talk to us about documenting best practices for Dataverse metadata and curation guides. Perfect. We can see you. Great. But we can't hear you unless you're not talking. Um, I got the go. screen shared properly. Now Sorry, we got you. Get it all perfect once. That's okay. It works now. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> I'm going to be talking today about um, two of the documents or guidance that uh, we are creating under the Andrea Portage um, <clears throat> uh, on Dataverse uh, metadata and curation guides. Oops. Andrea uh, Portage Network is a national initiative to build RDM capacity in Canada. It consists of a num number of working groups, including the Dataverse North Metadata Working Group and the Dataverse Curation Guide Working Group, the authors of the two guides that I'll be talking about today. But first, I'm going to start with why would we create these guides? Um, first off, to provide guidance in both French and English for marking up and curating data sets. The guides will also allow for consistency within the Canadian data verses. <clears throat> um, at last year's Dataverse community meeting, we presented volume two of the metadata guide. Our working group is currently finishing up on version three, uh, which will now include the metadata blocks uh, for all the metadata blocks within Dataverse, including, yes, the astronomy and astrophysics uh, block, which provided quite the learning curve for our working group members to figure out what everything meant and what it all was. <clears throat> the, 
the intended, uh, the intended audience for the metadata best practices guide is all levels of users from novice through experienced. The format for each field includes the dataverse definition of a field, a tip if needed, an example entry, and whether the field is required, recommended, or optional. Yes? Are you number three? Yeah. I just left your package. Okay, thank here. you. Is that okay? Yep. Okay, I left you a note too in case you forget. Sorry about that. Um, I just had a package delivered. <laughs> um, oh, where was I? Um, yeah, recommend our output. Um, there were a number of challenges in putting this guide together. Um, first off, complying with uh, the DDI when a number of fields in Dataverse um, are not, don't exactly match up. We had to use a number of Excel, uh, sorry, English examples in the French version because there were not enough um, French examples to use. That's something we're hoping to um, fix in future versions. And the time to put together such a document when members are all volunteers. This is a screenshot of the citation metadata, uh, metadata block showing the fields, the definitions with the tips in italics, uh, which fields are required, recommended, or optional, and the example available. And <clears throat> excuse me, throughout um, each section uh, of the guide, um, all the different metadata blocks, we did our best to stick to the same format. So it is the same, although in some, um, a couple of the metadata block sections, the examples are done a little bit differently. But we also make note of that um, in the guide. Now on to the Dataverse Curation Guide. The Dataverse Curation Guide was created to provide guidance for curators at all level. In the summer of 2020, our working group began an environmental scan looking for cur curation documents, but discovered that most of the documentation available was about depositing data in Dataverse, not curating data sets in Dataverse. Realizing we'd have to start from scratch, we looked to the Data Curation Network's curated model as a reference and revised it to work in the Dataverse environment uh, and to be fully bilingual in English and French, which is crucial to the RDM landscape in Canada. The guide is also written to fit different curation service scenarios and different levels of curation. Data creation, after all, is not a straight line and one size does not fit all. We all have different organizational constraints and goals, and I'll speak about more about these service levels uh, shortly. This slide shows you the backbone of the new curation model for our guide. English is on the left with its counterpart French on the right. The table may look familiar to you if you've used the DCN's curated framework. Our curation model takes its inspiration from the curated framework, which we, which we encourage you to look into. The shift from curated to curation is first and foremost a means to provide the same curatorial guidance in both English and French. Our letters are mostly the same, but some changes were required for it to work in both languages. For example, the I in inc for include and the O for optimi optimize for fairness. Aside from the acronym working in both official languages, we have added emphasis on licensing and PIDs. Now, <clears throat> um, a bit on the service scenarios. Our guide acknowledges that there's a range of curation services scenarios in Canada and likely in other countries too. In the past 10 years, institutional RDM blossomed in Canada due in no small part to community-driven Andrio Portage network and as well as long-standing programs such as the Data Liberation Initiative. However, no two institutions are alike and their service capacity or choice lies on a spectrum of full, fully mediated, semi-mediated to unmediated curation services. We want curators to aim high but we want the guides to be equally accessible to both the full-time curator and the professional who has cur curatorial responsibility, as well as three different roles in their institution, which is actually very common among many of our community members. As a result, our guide classified um, curatorial actions based on different levels of curation, uh, which you can see here. 
Level one is the minimum level of curation required to publish a dataverse data set and make it findable, while level two and three speak towards usability, reproducibility, preservation, and so on. So as you go through the level, le letters of curation, check, understand, recommend, the guide classifies curatorial activities by these different levels. You and your institution may be aiming for level one or level two or level three, depending on staffing, funding, or the service that you're able to provide. Whatever you're aiming for is okay, and the guide will help you get there. Oop, too fast. Um, this is a screenshot from the page of the Dataverse Curation Guide. <clears throat> As you can see, it provides a definition of the steps and, div and divides the steps into each level, one, two, and three. Um, in this example, this is an example from the check section, um, which is the first of the first step, and it's all level one, making making the data set publishable and findable. That's all that's basically required to um, to fulfill this step. Understand the second step builds on what level two and level three activities are. So when will these guides be released? Um, version three of the metadata guide will be released later this summer. We're in the final stages of proofreading and uh, doing the edits. Version two of this guide is available from the links on uh, in our presentation. Uh, and uh, for, you can look out for version three um, very soon, as I said, at the end of the summer. Um, version two of the guide takes, um, includes the sections for citation, geospatial, and social science and humanities. Um, the Dataverse Curation Guide has just been submitted to Andrea Portage's Curation Expert Group for review, and we anticipate it going live before the end of the summer, once the final revisions are made and the English and French versions are aligned with one another. For any questions or comments about the guides, you can contact myself or either one of the um, other co-chairs, Michael Steelworthy or Mark Goodwin, or you can contact Andrea Portage directly and all of our contacts are here. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. That was great. It, and and it's, it's interesting um, how I, I had not seen a lot of the, 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 the presentations um, before I, I made my two slides about my level. So I'm, I'm glad I was sort of on, on board with levels and it seems like we all have our own levels of curation too. Um, so, um, so, so last in our last but not least is, is Sonia. Um, she's going to talk to us about um, the cost tier services of the Harvard Dataverse Curation Services. I'm always muted when I start these things. Hi, everyone. Thank you. I'm actually not going to be talking for very long because of the time. Uh, but we do like to reiter reiterate that we have, um, we developed in the past, I want to say maybe a year and a half, two years now, because I've just lost track of time, curation services for those that are depositing into the Harvard Dataverse. Um, and our curation services um, are really based on making use of the Dataverse features to move their data towards FAIR. Um, you know, I, I was just talking on chat about, you know, managing a sensitive data curation and how much curation um, efforts we put into those data sets. Um, and we're not able to do that because our support team is so small. Um, you know, there's uh, maybe two and a half data curators uh, at Harvard Dataverse and we're already reviewing in the deposited content. But we are um, thinking about some workflows that will help us improve the deposited content that comes in um, from just a submit for review workflow for data sets that we can help authors improve before they publish uh, to, of course, our services, which are in use now. So we have a support system set up for someone who has requested curation support. They would come to us with you know, a proposal um, and we would uh, go over and do some consult consultation with them and determine how much their project would cost based on how much support they need, the number of data sets, the number of data verses. But what we, what we would guarantee is that they're using the features properly and they're using the features well to move their data towards FAIR. So while they might be doing all of the data cleaning, we're making sure that in terms of what the software provides, that the data um, are being uh, deposited well and the features are being used well. So as you can see, we have a Harvard and a non-Harvard um, 
service level uh, with different pricing. And we also have an ongoing maintenance um, portion that's available where the curation team would basically be responsible for following up with the organization um, on a set schedule to see if they have more data to ingest or more content to create. And we would help them do that. We also offer custom services. So um, if somebody who can't support an installation wants to use the Harvard Dataverse, but they happen to be from a larger library um, and they need more services, whether it's just assistance with batch file uploading or batch metadata work or um, anything of that nature, then we would be available to help at an hourly rate. Um, one of the things that we've also created um, is related to the core trust seal guide. So as the Harvard Dataverse creates a model for certifying generalist repositories, we are creating services that would help other installations um, to create policies and documents around core trust seal if they don't have them. So a lot of places might be coming in with incomplete research data uh, management websites or policies around um, how they, they instruct their authors to deposit data, follow appropriate formats. So we are creating um, some services around that as well. So I'm not actually gonna take up more time because everybody, um, I think most people here know about our services already and the consultations are usually free, um, but anything with a lot of data and a lot of time would require that services be um, purchased. So I will stop there and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have, but I don't think there's going to be any right now. So thank you. And I'll let Sherry do a little closing while we get to Q&A. Yeah, um, I've, I've, the, um, Kaylin's been doing a great job of catching up with what's going, going on. Um, it's been a great conversation and, um, in the chat. We've tried to capture questions and answers together in the Google document. Um, we did have a few questions that were um, asked um, beforehand. I'm just gonna sort of ask the panelists this one question, um, which is also a, a conversation that's been going on in the Slack about um, notifications and correspondence while you're doing this curation. So the question actually is, um, how do panelists manage their workflows um, do you use a specific ticket system or how do you manage the curation by multiple people um, if, if, if you have a system? Um, and I, th I think, you know, the discussion on chat was about the limitations of, of Dataverse, but um, who, who from the panel would like to start that discussion? I can start um, at uh, Dataverse now. We, I mean, at my university, we have a ticketing system, but we don't use it for uh, managing the curation workflow. Um, basically, we manage the curation workflow in a manual way. So um, every curator will get an email when a, a new data, data set is being submitted. And um, at, at my university, uh, usually the subject librarian responsible for the field within which the data set is would then respond to the other members of the curation team that uh, he or she will curate this data set. So it's very basic, basic workflow. But of course, as I said in my presentation, uh, we would like to have a more advanced or in enhanced uh, curation management system within or uh, integrated with, with Dataverse. So this is also why we have put this in, in one of our um, application uh, now. Um, yeah, um, funding uh, applications, grant applications. At my library, we, I guess we have a ticketing system and by we, I mean I and one other person, we use just like project management software like monday.com and we we're just recording the status based on metadata, licensing, readmes, file checks, uh, are there embargoes? Have we agreed to them? How long are they gonna be? How we mediate that? All hand mediated, of course, um, and then timelines. You know, we, did we make a promise of a timeline to ourselves or to the other person? Are we meeting that? Um, the the other part of that question, uh, templates and correspondence. Um, the the Dataverse curation guide that is in production and actually now in review with Portage or will be. It's being tabled on Monday. Um, makes recommendations for correspondence and it's going to have templates in there. That's coming from Portage's uh, further. 
uh, and it's all inspired through uh, uh, the curating research data two volume set edited by Lisa from a couple of years ago too, which is in there. So yeah, we are actually recommending uh, uh, through the creation guide, through what Alex and I are co-chairing that, that there are templates and, and when this goes through and hopefully when we figure it will be approved, there would be a, a standard template for people to look at and, and adjust and use. And I know Mara, I guess with the DCN, because you have, it's not just one institution, it's the network. Um, you guys do have a ticket system for that. We do. So uh, the data curation network uses JIRA as the project management tool to track all those tickets. And it, it would be really hard in the DCN without that. Um, locally, we had done it more informally for a long time, but we are really liking JIRA in the DCN. So the team of data management consultants uh, in our group are, are working on putting that our local workflow into JIRA to, to try and use it that way currently. And I don't know if any of them want to comment in the chat about, about that. It's in the planning phase, I think. And, and Harvard Dataverse has, um, uh, we have a, a support um, ticketing system as well. And part of the heart of the IQSS IT team helps to triage the tickets. So we have tickets that go to developers for those that are looking for installation related questions. And then we have um, tickets that come to part of the IT team and part of my curation team, depending on what the request is, whether if it's a, it's a demo or services, or they need help with some uh, feature. Um, what we try to do is, you know, uh, again, we get a lot of individual data set deposits, but then we allow organizations, institutions, and regular scholars to create data verses. For those that have really um, large data and we see that they have policy behind them, we always reach out to them after we review their deposits to see what we can help with and we contact them and they're very good about replying because we contact them about developing the, using the, the data verse um, level templates creating templates um, to, to support their data and support their workflows when they have a lot of people, uh, you know, if PRI is one of the organizations I can talk about, they have an enormous level of uh, like number of curators that help with their content. And they make use of the templates to make sure that there's consistency um, and they're capturing all of the information that they need to curate their data the way they need it. Um, you know, using the features like the guest book to collect information if they need it, uh, bringing in proper file formats, improving their policies as they need it. So that's really where a lot of our curation team efforts go because they are the ones that are really looking um, to make an impact with their data sharing. And they have these, these large funding agencies behind them. So we have to focus our, our assistance that, that are, are free support in some ways, we have to focus that because we wouldn't be able to otherwise, um, you know, handle the amount of content that comes into the repository. I think we have time for one more just sort of discussion question. I'm throwing it out to the panelists so they can discuss um, or talk about it. Um, how do the panelists currently see data management plans fitting into your cur curation workflow process? Um, it, are there enhancements to DMPs that can improve your workflow? Um, and how do you see repositories like Dataverse working together um, with data management plans? I may start. I mean, at, at, at my university, um, many of our curators, they would also give feedback on data management plans. But we currently don't use um, any tool to to create data management plans. Um, so I think if you ha would have a tool, it would kind of make it easier to provide feedback. And also, if that tool could be in, in integrated with uh, the Dataverse software, it would also make it easy because then we could could have easy easy access to the, the to the data management plan that is kind of affiliated to the data set. And then we could compare what they write in the data management plan and, and the way they have uh, registered their metadata and documentation and so on in, in, on the data set. At uh, my institution, as part of our um, research data management service, we provide guidance and help with data management plans. And we use the um, DMP assistant from Andrew Portage. Um, in terms of making it part of the curation flow, um, I could see, as, as Philip said, um, 
once someone has a DMP and they're at the part where they're doing the curation, it being part of the documentation would be useful. Um, I'm not sure that it's it's a huge part of the curation um, workflow um, from my point of view of um, when I'm getting, when I get the data and documentation, um, we do a, a semi-mediated um, <clears throat> uh, plan here at Queen's and um, the DMP would be useful that it would have information in it that would be useful to help fill out the metadata and Dataverse. Um, but aside from that, as part of the curation workflow, I'm not sure it's as important because it's mostly important at the beginning and through the project that DMPs are filled out. But having said that, DMPs are extremely important and they are one, one thing that uh, we really push on researchers to really start their projects with that, um, which is one of our biggest challenges right now is getting the um, research to agree to fill out a DMP um, and getting them to realize that it can help them through down the line. Thank you, and I think um, we, we have some closing ceremonies coming next, so we're going to end the session. I'd like to thank all the panelists um, and all the participants. Great chat. Um, thank you for contributing to the, the Google Doc, and of course, the data creation, you know, the, D, the Dataverse cat is right on cue for his party. He likes parties. So again, thank, thanks everyone, and hopefully we'll see you in the closing ceremonies. Um, on the next Zoom link. Bye. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Damn. The picture of Tim Zoom bombing was the most liked tweet uh, for Dataverse 2021. Oh, and Phil, looks like Marshall. Marshall is in there, too. I was wondering who's, do yeah, what, okay. Yeah, this is <laughs> hey, Marshall. <laughs> cool i'll see y'all in the uh in the closing session we'll get that started in uh, just a couple of minutes here thank you everyone